I'm Dr. Nidhi Gupta, and I am a senior consultant at the cornea and the ocular surface department. I also serve as a clinician scientist in the stem cell lab at uh, Dr. Shroff Charity Eye Hospital in Delhi. So uh, the way our uh, next hour is going to go is that we are going to start with trying to understand how did the amniotic membrane actually came to be uh, useful in ocular surface disorders in ophthalmology. And then what is its uh, unique structure and composition and mechanism of action, which makes it so useful as a biological membrane. Uh, then we'll go on to understand what is the process of procuring, processing and preserving it so that it can be implanted into the eye and useful in our clinics in ophthalmology. In the second half of my talk, I would be actually taking you into the OR and we'll be discussing about principles of surgery, the various techniques, which are uh, used while we are implanting the amniotic membrane. Then I've tried to put in a lot of cases, different case scenarios wherein I have used amniotic membrane and it's very, very useful in those scenarios and various principles and surgical techniques have been used there. And we'll show you the follow-ups. And finally, uh, definitely all of this is loaded with the surgical videos. So this amniotic membrane actually is, it's a Greek word, which is derived from the word amnos, which means the lamb. So it is the, we all know it is the uh, inner lining of the placental sac. And usually it is discarded as a waste product. But if you look at the origin of this membrane, uh, it is derived from the epiblast, which is the outer cell mass. And the fetus is derived from the inner cell mass. So understanding its usage over time, uh, it was, uh, it, it's, its unique characteristic properties, it was started to, it was taken up for use in the clinical users, mainly in um, by skin specialists. And that is because it's got a very, very unique structure. It is highly biocompatible. It is non-immunogenic. It does not produce any immune reaction in the host when it is used as a graft. It has got very important biological functions so that it acts at every stage of wound healing. It is easily available, very, very unlimited amount in unlimited amount. And since it does not uh, transfer any form of immune reaction, then it, is, it has no ethical issues as well. So if you look at the history earlier, as I said, it was used by uh, Dr. Davis in 1910 as a covering for the damage, the skin burn patients. And later on, it was used widely by physicians. But in ophthalmology, it was only by D. Roth in 1940 when he used for the first time for treating cases wherein there was a severe grade of simbliferon in burn patients. And he removed the simbliferon and used the amniotic membrane instead of the earlier use of the peritoneum. And he found remarkable results. Later on, this membrane was not used for quite a lot of time, primarily because freshly prepared amniotic membrane was only required and it, uh, there was a risk of transmission of infection. Until later on, various protocols came in for its use and it's only later that uh, you know, it came as a big bang in ophthalmology. And since then, if you look at the papers, there are thousands of papers on amniotic membrane and it's extremely beneficial on the ocular surface. Looking at its structure, the amniotic membrane is primarily consists of three layers. It has got an epithelial layer, which is uh, actually a single layer of cuboidal epithelial cells, which is lower, uh, below it is the compact layer of the stroma, which has got a, a layer of fibroblasts as well. And below the basement membrane is the stroma layer, and then comes the layers of the chorion. So the chorion and the amnion are very closely adhered to each other. There is a, inter there's a middle layer of fibroblast layer between the amniotic and the, uh, and the chorionic layer. So you, the amniotic membrane is about 0.02 to 0.4 mm thick, and it's got an epithelial layer as we discussed. Uh, later, the various other parts of it, the basement membrane and the stromal matrix are actually the ones which are useful as the biological products. The basement membrane consists of the collagen four, the collagen seven, and the collagen five in abundance along with fibronectin and laminin. This membrane is very similar to the other basement membranes of the eye, like the 
Bowman's membrane, the Desmet's membrane, and the lens capsule. The, they have very similar proteins. And the stromal matrix is very, very rich in the growth factors. And these are the growth factors which help in the growth of the epithelial cells. So if you look at the mechanism of action of, a, of the amniotic membrane, it basically facilitates every step of wound healing. It helps in epithelization. It not only pro pro promotes the epithelization, it maintains the epithelial phenotype. It is anti-inflammatory, it is anti-fibrotic, and it is anti-androgenic. And all of this together reduces the pain as well. The direct mechanism of how it reduces pain is unknown, but however, it's understood that all of this together uh, is acting as reduction of pain in the patient. So if we go on to understand that what are the factors by which it promotes the epithelization, then first and foremost comes the basement membrane. The basement membrane itself acts as, as, as I said, is very similar to the basement membrane of the Bowman's like the Desmet's. It helps in migration of the epithelial cells of the host cornea. These cells can adhere to the basement membrane and they promote uh, differentiation of these cells into the phenotype of that particular cornea and prevents the epithelial apoptosis as well. It also produces the various growth factors, which are like the epidermal growth factors, the keratocyte growth factors, the hep hepatocyte growth factors, and inhibits the protease activity. Uh, uh, the other functions, which are the anti-inflammatory, anti-angiogenic scarring, and anti-fibrotic, they all are actually working together. The, you cannot differentiate as to which factors cause which particularly, but together there are multiple reasons why the amniotic membrane uh, is, is effective in all of the above functions. So it, as I said, promotes cellular apoptosis of the inflammatory cells. It also regulates, down-regulates the expression of CD80, CD86, the major histocompatibility complex two. It induces the down-regulation of transforming growth factors. It is also an anatomical barrier which keeps away the bare surfaces. It also has got the transcripts and proteins of tissue inhibitors of metalloproteas. So coming, going on from the various layers to the various properties, let's go to understand that how it can be useful in clinics. What are the protocols of it being used to make it useful in clinics? So uh, it is procured from the gynecologist who are going to be doing from mothers of consenting and planned cesarean sections. Uh, these mothers are tested negative for HIV, hepatitis, syphilis at one and six months uh, are only the ones which can be donors for the amniotic membrane. So usually if you will see, it comes like a huge placenta. So that's, that's what they give. They give the placenta to the ophthalmologist who are, uh, who are having a collaboration with them. And this placenta is then cleaned with the uh, BSS and a cocktail of antibiotics. And then the amnion and the chorion, the second picture shows here that the amnion and the chorion, how they're closely adherent are actually dissected off with blunt dissection. And once you have the chorion, which is separated, uh, then it is completely washed off of all the blood and the heme and the clot, which it has. And then finally, uh, the nitrocellulose papers are put over this amniotic membrane. It is cut to various sizes, depend upon the clinician's usage. And then they can be cryopreserved at minus 80 degree uh, in the uh, preservation media, which is Dubelco's modified Eagles media, along with glycerol, which helps, to, uh, which helps to keep it for long. You can even keep it for about six months to one year in refrigerated state. And this is how the Dubelco's media looks like. It's a pink colored media. And that's, that's the shape and the size of the amniotic membrane, where shapes and size can be cut of the nitrocellulose paper, depending upon what's the usage that you have. So apart from the cryopreserve one, uh, which is, uh, can be kept for a long time, uh, the other things which are available, the other commercially available amniotic membrane, and I have no financial interest in these, are the various, one of these various available companies which are there, they are basically freeze drying or lyophilizing the amniotic membrane. So what happens in them is that they take the amniotic membrane, they, cry, they cryopreserve it, then uh, it undergoes a process of sublimation wherein the, it is dehydrated and then gamma irradiated to remove 
uh, any of the infections from it. And finally, it is preserved. But this comes like a paper thin membrane, which is a dehydrated membrane. And only when it becomes wet, does it actually uh, become wet and uh, you can spread it on the surface. So there are various companies which are available for the, uh, for the various types of uh, freeze-dried amniotic membrane. If you would uh, compare, there is a question which had come up that comparing the fresh versus the ones which is cryopreserved versus the freeze dry uh, versus the, uh, the, the commercially available, which ones are the best? So definitely the fresh uh, amniotic membrane has got maximum growth factors and it would be best for the ocular surface. However, until it is not tested for infection, the, the risk of transmission of infection is high. So it is nice that you and uh, to have a cryopreserved one, which can be preserved also for longer and is tested for any forms of infection. And uh, the comparison of uh, it to the totally dry one, then definitely it's to be understood that the more you freeze dry, the more you cryopreserve it and then dehydrate it, the more number of growth factors go down. So definitely the results would be best and most widely used is the cryopreserved amniotic membrane. So going on from the procurement to processing, let's go on to understand that where are, what are the various surgical techniques which are used to do the amniotic membrane. So the basic principle is that you could either use it as an onlay or as an inlay technique or as a sandwich technique. So only patch primarily means when the amniotic membrane is placed with the basement membrane down and the where wherein the stroma is uh, basement membrane down and the amniotic membrane acts as the temporary biological bandage and it acts as a physical barrier to the external to the surroundings then the epithelium starts to grow below the amniotic membrane and it helps to, it helps, it slowly degrades and gets removed, but the epithelium comes, grows below this amniotic membrane. So basically this is a kind of an amniotic membrane with a basement membrane uh, acts as a barrier against the outside, outside environment and it's only below which the epithelium grows in. However, you could also use it as an inlay patch wherein you have a large epithelial defect or a defect wherein you can put an amniotic membrane graft with the basement membrane up and the stromal side down and the amniotic membrane acts as a scaffold for the epithelial cells to grow it and it gets integrated this tissue gets integrated in inlay as an inlay patch and it acts as a substitute for this it is called as a graft so it's basically it requires the basement membrane is up and you have the epithelial cells which start growing above it so that's called an inlay patch wherein it can be used as a substitute for large epithelial defects. You can also use it as a combination of techniques, which is called the sandwich technique, wherein you can actually fill in the graft, fill in the defect with an inlay graft, and then you can put an only amniotic membrane to act like a bandage contact lens to prevent and behave as an anti-inflammatory and as a barrier function as well. So let us go through this video and this video will help you understand this technique. So this is a patient, Just I'll just stop the video here. So this is a patient wherein you can see there is a persistent epithelial defect. So this was a grade four chemical burn and the patient was on medical therapy for a long time. And then at about three weeks of its presentation, the epithelial defect was not healing. And that's where we are going ahead and doing an uh, amniotic membrane. So what you see here is the nitrocellulose paper on which the amniotic membrane is spread out. And what we are trying to do is first to take a forceps, uh, which is a non-tooth forceps and trying to actually peel off the amniotic membrane separated from the nitrocellulose paper and put it onto the ocular surface. And once it's put on the ocular surface, you can spread it with the, uh, the non-tooth forceps. You can try to spread it with the non-tooth forceps and make it like a single layer. The curled up membrane is made into a single layer. And actually at this step, I have not done it here in the video. Uh, you can touch a bud and check which is the stromal side, which is the epithelial, which is the basement membrane cell. So the stromal side would have the chorionic fibers, a few fibers, white fibers, which are sticky. Whereas at the basement membrane side, it is very, very, it, it is, it is non-sticky and it is clear membrane. So you would not get any stick, stickiness with your bud on that side. So here, since we are using as an only 
technique. So what I what has happened here is that I'm trying to suture it now uh, using a 10-0 nylon sutures about three to four m m mm away from the limbus. You could actually take these sutures at the limbus as well with vicryl also. I like nylon sutures primarily because they are more neat than the vicryl sutures. And, um, and, and that's why I've tried to take a continuous suture, uh, a, a single suture, which is going to go like a purse string around the limbus. So this, this may cause some amount of bleeding because where your suture is passing is actually your episclera. It is passing through episclera. You can have some bleeding and that bleeding needs to be removed from below the amniotic membrane. Otherwise, your epithelization can get delayed because of the bleeding which happens. So I'll just fast forward this video to show you how the first string suture is passed and then tie it at one end and the extra membrane is cut off. The bleeding is all cleaned up from the ocular surface. And you can, once you clean up the bleeding by pressing again with, the, with, the, with your forceps, then you can put a bandaged contact lens. You may, may not choose to do a tarsorephy along, depending upon what is the indication of your patient. So that's the only technique of amniotic membrane. Let's go on to the second video, wherein I'm actually discussing the inlay technique of amniotic membrane. So I'll go back to the picture of this patient start the video. So this is a patient of uh, Steven Johnson syndrome, which presented in the clinics with a desmetosil. You can notice that there is a lot of vascularization on the ocular surface. That's where you can see the desmetosil and there is inflammation of the ocular surface as well. Uh, what we are going to do here is we are going to take the amniotic membrane and I'm trying to cut a very, very small piece of amniotic membrane which can fit into this defect and use the fibrin glue here to first fashion my amniotic membrane, use the fibrin glue and replace this small defect with the amniotic membrane. So it is actually used in an inlay, you're actually using a small graft inside this defect that you have. And once I have done that, that that's where I'm transplanting and pressing onto it sticks very well with the amniotic membrane. You can use multiple layers as well. Uh, designing it like uh, on this fashioning the amniotic membrane the same size and use multiple layers depending upon the depth of your defect and then i'm combining it i'm sand i'm doing the sandwich technique actually combining it with an only amniotic membrane seeing the inflammation on the ocular surface here so we have actually done uh, only along amniotic membrane along with it uh, towards the end we'll be removing all the bleeding here and put a bcl onto the ocular surface and this patient really healed well. We'll see some examples uh, in the cases where we have discussed. So that's was, that was the inlay and the onlay technique and the sandwich technique of the amniotic membrane on the ocular surface. Uh, from here, uh, let's go on to discuss some of the case examples wherein we have used this, uh, these techniques. Uh, so this is a patient, this was, um, a 20 year old uh, a patient who had a thermal burn. And this is an acute stage. He almost presented about two weeks of thermal burn. You can actually see the large area of the epithelial defect. Not only the epithelial defect, there is an inferior area of ischemia, which you can notice from about four to six to eight clock hours. That's, that's the area where there is clear ischemia as well. There is involvement of the lid burn as well in this patient. Uh, the video, this video which I'm showing is not of this patient, but what I wanted to show here is that in acute burn, uh, this is a very similar child who had come, uh, a Lyme injury, wherein you can see that there is a lot of limbal ischemia here, as well as conjunctival necrosis secondary to the acute chemical burn. What, what, what we are doing now is first we are trying to remove all the necrosed epithelium, the, which is from the cornea, as well as if you see, you'll notice that there is a very, very thick necrose conjunctival epithelium, which, which has become thick and necrose. We are trying to remove all of the necrosed epithelium. And once we have removed the necrosed epithelium, we'll be doing combining a tenon plasty procedure, wherein we'll be pulling up tenons from all areas in the periphery, uh, from near the muscles to get it close to these areas of ischemia. 
uh, and suture it with the 10-0 nylon. So that's where I'm pulling in all the tenons. I'm just setting it off in the periphery and trying to pull in to actually heal, to treat the necrosis of the sclera, which has come the ischemia of the, uh, of the sclera. And we, I'm suturing it with the 10-0 nylon sutures. I've used fibrin glue as well in this patient, which helps me to reduce the number of sutures and makes the procedure quicker uh, in such patients. Once I have done uh, a tenon plasty 360 degree for this patient, as you can notice here, I've put an amniotic membrane on lay on this, and I'll be suturing this amniotic membrane with a 10-0 nylon suture and put a BCL on the top of it. So that's about this patient wherein you can use it in the acute stage. So this is how the post-op looks like wherein you have a purse string suture and an only amniotic membrane. This amniotic membrane in such cases where there's so much of inflammation can undergo degradation and you may have to replace it after one or two weeks as much possible uh, until you have a reduction, uh, until your surface epithelizes in case it gets degraded earlier than epithelization. So this patient later on over the next six months did extremely well and we didn't require a second procedure and the ocular surface became quiet and there was no, there was, there was no further requirement of only medical management was maintained. The patient gained 6-9 vision over, over months. The second indication wherein an acute stage amniotic membrane is extensively used in ocular surface is the acute Steven Johnson syndrome. Here, this is a patient uh, wherein uh, you may have to actually be seeing the patient and ophthalmologist may be called in an ICU. And uh, what we are seeing here at the bedside, this is actually one of the patients in which I was called at the multi-speciality hospital wherein this child was suffering from acute Steven Johnson syndrome. And you can notice in both the eyes, there is a lot of conjunctivitis that you can see. There is an early lid keratinization, which is coming up. And what you can see is actually uh, an epithelial defect in one of the eyes. The technique which is used here is a bedside amniotic membrane can be done depending upon the systemic situation and how you are placed for this patient. You can either do, if, if possible under GA, you can actually do a lid to grid amniotic membrane. But the, but the more important point in this technique is that the amniotic membrane should be spread anterior to the lid margin and goes down onto the ocular surface, spreads onto the ocular surface and comes out through the lower lid anterior to the lid margin. So you have to actually be covering the gray line in these patients on both the upper and the lower lid to prevent the further lid keratinization, which can be prevented with using of this amniotic membrane. And also it reduces the inflammation and heals the epithelial defect, apart from the medical management of course, which goes along. If you are not able to do the suturing, you can actually take a Procara, which is which is a, a amniotic membrane on a round ring, which can be just placed onto the ocular surface. So uh, there, they, you, th this really helps in reducing in long-term the chronic uh, sequelae in these patients of uh, Steven Johnson syndrome. Other situations which are very commonly present in our OPDs are the persistent epithelial defects. Uh, that could be secondary to a post-PK patient wherein you have an epithelial defect on the graft, which is not healing with the medical management. It could be also a neurotropic ulcer. It could be a corneal infective keratitis, which has become now non-infective and there is a persistent epithelial defect and not actually very resistant to your usual medical management. In those situations, you can do an onlay amniotic membrane. Like in this patient, there was a superior, almost 30% uh, of the cornea was involved in this persistent epithelial defect following a very, very complicated cataract surgery, wherein the patient's epithelium was just not healing. And this is a diabetic patient as well, although controlled, wherein we did an only amniotic membrane and it healed very well in two to three weeks time. So this is the, I guess, the most common indication apart from chemical burns, wherein an onlay or an inlay, a combination could be done for a persistent epithelial defect. Then there are patients of bullous keratopathy wherein you're not planning a DSEC or a DMAC and has got a very poor prognostic, uh, prognosis for any form of transplantation. And it's an end-stage disorder wherein the patient is coming with pain. Then you could think of doing an onlay amniotic membrane. It helps them heal with the pain as well. Comes, the pain also comes down in these patients. 
This is one more indication wherein you could have patients with band keratopathy, wherein you do an ADTA removal of the band keratopathy and to heal the ocular surface, you could combine uh, EDTA along with uh, only amniotic membrane heals very, very well in these patients. Also reduces the post-op pain, which otherwise could be a problem post EDTA. Now, let's see some examples wherein the amniotic membrane has been used by an, by an inlay technique. So uh, I guess a lot of questions had come about the use of the amniotic membrane in pterygium surgery. So in primary pterygium, if you have a small pterygium involving a few clock hours, then only a conjunctival autograph may be sufficient. However, in patients in which you have an extensive pterygium, involving a lot of clock hours, or you have a bi-headed pterygium, then you could combine your conjunctival autograft by this technique that you can have a large amniotic membrane graft covering the whole of the uh, defect that you have produced and use a small conjunctival autograft over this using a fibrin glue, which could prevent the reoccurrences as well. But the primary use of an amniotic membrane in a primary pterygium would not produce results as good as a conjunctival autograft. So that's where in pterygium you could be using an extensive pterygium. You could be combining it with a conjunctival autograft. This is a very interesting patient. This is a patient wherein there was a desmetocele. So this is a patient of Steven Johnson syndrome where you can see the upper and the lower lid keratinization. And that's definitely responsible for this desmetocele which has happened. So here we did, uh, we apart from treating the lids, we did a multi-layered amniotic membrane and it's healed very beautifully and reduced down the inflammation also from the ocular surface. Uh, one more place where uh, I have used this is the dermoid excision. And instead of using a patch graft, uh, a corneal tissue, a multi-layered amniotic membrane grafting has been done like in this patient. And it, it really, really substitutes the tissue very well uh, and uh, produces very less astigmatism. So in these patients also, you could actually go ahead and use a multi-layered amniotic membrane it substitutes the corneal tissue and uh, the defect can be healed. Uh, this is a patient of peripheral ulcerative keratitis wherein an inlay amniotic membrane has been done along with it and only has been done uh, uh, along with um, the excision of the peripheral rim of the uh, conjunctiva and then only has been done for this and heal very well uh, in, 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 with an inlay and an only. Uh, from here, I guess I'll be sharing a very long case history of this child and take you from acute to chronic usage in chemical burn of amniotic membrane graft. Uh, so this is a grade five chemical burn, which came as a two weeks of Chuna injury. And you can see the whole of the ocular surface, the corneal and the conjunctival epithelium is gone. Uh, what we did was in the acute stage, two, two to three times we had to do an amniotic membrane grafting in this child. And later on at six months, it healed with almost a total LSCD, limbal stem cell deficiency with a superior simpliferon. And uh, six months later to that, we went ahead and we did the procedure of limbal stem cell transplantation. Now that's, that's called, what we are doing very extensively now is the simple limbal epithelial transplantation, wherein you really do not require a lab to grow your limbal biopsy. So in this child, I'll just quickly show you the procedure. This is where we are taking the biopsy from the good eye, from the other eye of the patient, which is healthy. Uh, about two mm biopsy is being taken from the good eye of this patient. And then uh, on the other eye, once the biopsy is taken from the good eye, that's the limbus we are trying to harvest from the patient's uh, superior limbus, two mm of the biopsy. And then we go into the disease eye, wherein a 360 degree periotomy is done about 4 mm away from the limbus and the panus is removed from the ocular surface from the cornea. Once the panus is removed uh, over from the cornea, then an only AMG is done with the fibrin glue and it is stuck in, in the periphery below the, uh, below the conjunctiva 360 degree. You can put a fibrin glue, tuck it inside and once that has been done, you have, you can put the limbal biopsy uh, about eight to 12 pieces of limbal biopsy. That's where we are putting the limbal biopsy onto the ocular surface in the paracentral cornea, away from the limbus as well, about two to three mm inside the limbus. And this very, works very, very well 
uh, as an ex vivo method, as an in vivo method of a stem cell transplantation. This is this is extremely producing very very good results, and that's that's the, that's that's the child. Now, postoperatively, you can see we have a very long follow up of many many patients of SLED, and they do very very well. So, amniotic membrane uh, actually. Uh, is helpful in both acute and in stem cell transplantation with SLET as well. Uh, from SLET, let's go on to patients where it has been used for simbliferon release and phonics formation. So this is a child which had uh, like a grade three simbliferon, very, very extensive. So we did a stepwise surgery wherein using the amniotic membrane, we first did the, the simbliferon release and phonics formation. Then a slit was done, and then later on it was followed by a penetrating keratoplasty and a cataract surgery, and the child is doing extremely well. Uh, using uh, it also, it is used in conjunctival tumors, and this is a child. This is a patient of OSSN, wherein a large OSSN has been excised from the ocular surface. You can notice here that a large conjunctival defect and a corneal defect is produced post excision of this OSSN, and here a uh, 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 conjunctival uh, patch graft was put in the defect which was produced and combined with an only amniotic membrane, it heals very well. So it actually can substitute the conjunctival defects. This is an example when it has been used as a sandwich technique. This is a patient which has presented two months later after corneal melt. And you can see there is a desmetoseal, there is a corneal inflammation, and there is a large epithelial defect as well. We combine the inlay with an onlay and actually multi-layered inlay with an onlay. So the inlay, multi-layered inlay actually helps to close the defect and the desmetoseal and the onlay helped to uh, cover up whole of the ocular surface and it helped to heal the patient. Later on, the patient uh, went ahead. We did a doubt for this patient and did very well. Uh, it can also be used to relieve the pain in the end stage disorder, induce the inflammation, so this was a patient where uh, it, was, it was sent from somewhere else as a referral. Uh, the child had a chemical burn, a stem cell transplantation was attempted. It had a total melt. We did a therapeutic PK. And later on, we combined with an amniotic membrane grafting to quieten the eye with, along with the Gunderson flap in this, in this child. So in end-stage disorder also to relieve the pain and inflammation, uh, it can be used as an only technique. So going on from clinics, I think we all know that uh, amniotic membrane acts uh, 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 as a very, very good uh, substitute uh, wherein it, it is used in cultivated stem cell transplantation also. All the CLET is now uh, not so much used as in SLET, but CLET is, CLET is where you can actually use it in ex vivo stem cell, uh, uh, grow, growing the cells in ex vivo as well. So that is one place where it is used in lab. So that's about from the clinics wherein we use extensively a lot of amniotic membrane in various indications. So the, the, some very few contraindications wherein the amniotic membrane should not be used uh, would be cases wherein it is a severely dry eye, a keratinized surface, uh, where it is going to just fall off and will not be taken up is in these situations. In simple cases of dry eye, it can help you to, uh, to, to, to reduce the inflammation and improve the ocular surface. However, in patients of severe dry, it, is not, it does not really act. And patients in which there is poor blink mechanism, or like I said, if there is a place wherein you have an ischemia, it would actually, like, like we saw the case in where there was a steril ischemia, you would have to first give in some form of vascularization to that tissue before you can help allow it to be epithelizing using an amniotic membrane. Some of the very, very few complications reported, uh, although very, very minor complications could be a hematoma, and you would have to actually uh, remove that blood from below the amniotic membrane for it to act on the ocular surface. Uh, that could be there. Uh, there could be a premature degradation if there is a lot of inflammation on the ocular surface. You may have to do it again. Uh, there, there could be a microbial infection, uh, very much possible. Uh, you'll have to remove the, uh, the amniotic membrane and, uh, uh, and use the antibiotics to treat it. And there could be drug deposits on it if, if you're combining with by using uh, a lot of drops apart from the lubricants. So that's about the com complications in the amniotic membrane grafting. Something which I wanted to bring up was, uh, was the use of the amniotic membrane 
uh, as, along with the bioengineering of it into forming into a much useful either a gel, a powder, etc. So amniotic membrane extracts are something which is the new field which is coming up where an amio the properties, the biological properties of the amniotic membrane are used and these extracts are combined with various other combinations of various other components to make it more useful in various other places, not only in ophthalmology, <coughs> but also in systemic disorders, it is being used. So that's what it is about the amniotic membrane extracts, which, which can be useful in various other uh, situations. It's something I'm not going to be talking about much, but that's the future probably of amniotic membrane. So <coughs> coming towards the end of my talk, I'll just conclude to say that amniotic membrane grafting has biological properties which help in every stage of wound healing. Cryopreserved is the most widely used for surface reconstruction. You could use an inlay or a non-lay or a sandwich technique depending upon what is, this, what is the clinical case that you're dealing with. But it is extensively and very, very important in chemical burns. And it is now used a lot in stem cell transplantation with SLET. Uh, so I think it's, it's a technique which is going to go a long way. I want to thank my team at Shroff. That's the clinical team on the top. We have a great, amazing team with which I work and the team at the clinician scientists in the stem cell lab. It's a hundred year hospital and you're welcome anytime in Delhi to attend, to be, to be a part of our team. Thank you all. And I, uh, I would be taking up questions now. So the first question is uh, from Tishom. Thank you, Tishom, for your question. And your question is that, are there other alternative or options to amniotic membrane transplantation? In places where the harvesting of amniotic membrane is less practiced, what is the advice? Uh, I think for, I think the most common indication wherein uh, an, an amniotic membrane is used is either an acute chemical burn or in pterygium. In pterygium, like I said, if it's a primary pterygium, you can take a conjunctival autograph. Uh, you, you, if you, it's a large pterygium, you can think of taking some part of the conjunctival autograph from the other eye as well, or from other uh, or other area of the ocular surface from the same eye. If you are wanting a large conjunctival autograph, and uh, if 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 in acute chemical burn, probably you would have to use eye drops if you do not have an amniotic membrane. Uh, uh, maybe the extracts and the uh, you could think of using, uh, if not cryopreserved, then the ones which I showed, the lyophilized ones, maybe the ones which are very commercially available, Mogis, and you could think of using uh, those um, uh, your in, in your clinical practice. They are widely used as commercial membranes. Uh, I hope I've answered your question. I'll go on to the uh, next question, and that says, uh, that is there an optimum age of an amniotic membrane gap which facilitates its clinical usefulness? Uh, uh, I guess the question meant that is there a, a particular period, time period till which it acts? So uh, like I said, at minus 80 degree, you could preserve it for a very, very long time, about six months to a year, and uh, its growth factors are preserved. It's shown that growth factors are preserved and it acts very well uh, for a very long time. So I guess that's not a problem. You could use it for a very long duration. Uh, the next question to us says that how many times can we use AMT in case of a persistent corneal epithelial defect with corneal perforation? Can we use a glue or a tenens or a perforation with or a perforation? Okay. So uh, in a corneal, I, I, uh, the cases that I had shown to you in desmetal seal, you can use uh, in large desmetal seals also. Uh, you can use multi-layered amniotic membrane transplantation, about four to five mm epithelial defects. You can use easily a multi-layered amniotic membrane transplantation. In cases, yes, you can combine it with glue, like I showed it in your cases. Uh, in the cases, uh, you can combine it with a tenens patch graft as well. However, in cases where there is a perforation, uh, amniotic membrane alone may not help. And then you could either decide to use a, 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 either a glue or you could decide to use a patch graft. That would be more appropriate because the tensile strength of amniotic membrane is not very great. So uh, it would give way in a patient where you have a perforation. So that would not be appropriate. Uh, we have a question which um, says, 
How will you prevent the dry eye amnion from slipping out of the bandage contact lens? Do we need to suture it if we have no fibrin glue? Yes, we need to suture it. You can use, a, like I said, a 10-0 nylon suture or a vicryl suture. You can either take a purse string suture along the amniotic membrane, or you could take interrupted multiple sutures. So it, 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 it falls flat onto the ocular surface. Uh, I hope that uh, answers your question. Uh, we can, can we use patient's own tenants to fill the defect? Yes, we can use patient's own tenants to fill the defect. That's called a tenant, that's called a tenant's patch graft. It's widely mentioned in literature and it's very, very useful and very, very effective. You could go ahead and do a tenant's patch graft. Uh, we have a question which says, when we use single layer of amniotic, we have to put the epithelium down towards the corneal epithelium. I guess I've answered that question very extensively in my uh, presentation where I have told you that there is an inlay and an onlay technique and a sandwich technique. So depending upon if uh, what is your, what are you using for, you can decide to use the basement membrane up or a basement membrane down. Uh, you, you, I hope I have answered that question while I was presenting. Uh, is there any difference in amniotic membrane transplant insertion, epithelial side up or down for corneal epithelial defect? So yes, uh, I answered that as well in my presentation that if, there, if you're using it with the basement membrane up, then the epithelium is going to grow above it. Uh, so that is most useful in, in, in cases where you have a crater. Uh, however, if you're using as an onlay patch and the basement membrane is up and the stromal side is down, the epithelium would be sliding on both the sides to, to cover the defect. So only the growth factors are acting on the surface. It is not utilizing the basement membrane of the, of the amniotic. So that, that's where you have to make the decision whether you want to use it with the basement membrane up or the basement membrane down. So where uh, there is a question by Dr. Major, where I can find all the process to prepare my own amniotic membrane, my country doesn't have it. Uh, there, there is a lot of literature about this. Dr. Major, you can, uh, if you want, you can contact me on my email ID. We can send you the uh, exact protocol that we follow. But these steps which I showed are exactly the steps uh, which uh, for the amniotic membrane present, uh, uh, preparation. And it can be, uh, you can have a collaboration with the practicing gynecologist. Uh, you can take their uh, uh, amniotic placenta from the cesarean section and one placenta prepares a lot of amniotic membrane, which may last for about three to six months for you. So, uh, so and, and the methodology is mentioned in literature. Uh, you could also email us. We can send you through our iBank. What is what we are following? The next question comes from Dr. Ayer. And she wants to know, in veterinary ophthalmology, I use fresh amniotic membrane graft for dermoid. Any special advantage over preserved one? Yes, fresh is, uh, is the one which has got max amount of growth factors. The only issue with it is that you procure so much amount of, uh, of the placenta and you only use it for one patient. Uh, so uh, that, that, that's not good. So that's why to have a cryopreserved one wherein one placenta can be used to prepare uh, so many of the amniotic and can be kept for later use as well is why cryopreserved is used worldwide. So it's, it's, it's definitely better to have anything which is fresh, which will have maximum growth factors, but you could actually use one placenta for many patients if you cryopreserve it. Uh, we have a question here which says, uh, when to decide whether it is a single layer or multi-layer, especially when using dry amniotic membrane. So it will just depend upon uh, the uh, amount of defect that you have in a desmetoseal, you could decide to use multi-layers. So where you have to substitute the corneal tissue, there you would require a multi-layer, wherein where you do not need to substitute a, 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 a corneal tissue, then you do not use multi-layer. Like I showed two to three patients I've shown in my presentation, when we have used multi-layer and sandwich technique for uh, amniotic membrane. Uh, Dr. Ma Dr. Mittal wants to know, Placentrix gel is already available in market use for healing. Is can be used in ophthalmic field too for purpose of healing. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of this gel, Dr. Mittal. Uh, I would not be able to answer this question. Uh, I'll go on to the next one. In chemical injury, do you prefer to do the amniotic membrane transplant immediately or delayed? So that's a very important question. Uh, uh, whether to do an amniotic membrane transplant early or late in a chemical burn. So if it's a grade 
two to three chemical burn. You could wait for the medical management for, uh, for the epithelial defect to heal. However, it's grade four or above, it's best to use AMT uh, as soon as possible for these patients because they have a long-term impact if you're not using an amniotic membrane transplantation. So there have been a lot of randomized controlled trial wherein they have used uh, amniotic AMT versus the medical management, uh, 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 wherein they found that um, in, in grade four and above, definitely amniotic membrane transplant is going to go a long way. In grade four and below, maybe you could wait for the medical management and decide to do AMT a little later if the epithelial defect does not heal. So what is the final vinyl destination of amniotic membrane epithelium in case of inlay and sandwich technique? Is there any risk of epithelial ingrowth? No, there is no risk of epithelial ingrowth because epithelium is a devitalized epithelium. The moment you process it, there are no epithelial cells which remain. So they do not have any immunogenic properties or they do not ingrow. So there is no, no risk of having any type of epithelial complications because it's a devitalized membrane. The next question is, uh, is there, in which media is preserved usually the tracts of the amniotic? It's the Dubelco's media with the glycerol uh, in which the AMT is preserved for in cryopreserved amniotic membrane. Is there, uh, in next question is, is there in any indication of AMT in infectious keratitis? Yes, the literature has mentioned the use of AMT in infectious keratitis as well. And it is used in, uh, in patients wherein you have a, a, a inf infective keratitis. Uh, uh, you could uh, go ahead and look for literature uh, uh, a bit about this uh, because it does inhibit the, uh, a few of the organisms as well. The next is if both patients' eyes affected, where amniotic membrane to, to be used come from? In both patients' eyes affect, you can, have, you can use two amniotic membranes. If your patient has a bilateral injury, then you can use a larger amniotic membrane. You could divide it into two and use for both the eyes. So I guess that's answered. We have Dr. Brahmin asking uh, us that, what is your experience with AMT and corneal perforation? Do you use alone or with tenens patch graft, large perforation or small? I did show this and I've answered that in previous question with one of the attendees. Uh, we just answered that question. Uh, how about the effectivity? How about the effectivity in treating infectious keratitis? We just answered that question. What is your opinion on using AM amniotic membrane compared with mitomycin C for extensive pterygium in reoccurrence to prevent reoccurrence? So, um, uh, amniotic, first of all, in primary pterygium, uh, only if, you're, if you do not have a very extensive pterygium. There you can use a conjunctival autograph that works extremely well. Uh, if you have a very extensive pteridia, then I have not combined it with mitomycin C. What I have done is I have used a large amniotic membrane like what I showed in my presentation and done a conjunctival autograph above it. So I've really not combined with mitomycin C and it's worked very well in my hands without using uh, mitomycin C. The only place where I would use a mitomycin C are in patients of chemical burn wherein I'm trying to deconstruct a large simbifiron. That's where uh, reoccurrence of the simbifiron uh, is prevented with the use of the mitomycin C. Uh, what about amniotic membrane eye drops? Yes, there is mention of the amniotic membrane eye drops as well. I do not have any personal experience, but the literature does say, uh, 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 talk about the amniotic membrane eye drops being effective. Uh, the next question is, is there any difference in final outcome if we do the conjunctival periotomy? and suture the amniotic membrane with sclera or without periotomy and suturing it through the conjunctiva. I think the question would have to be combined with what is the pathology that we are talking about. Uh, if we do the conjunctival periotomy and suture there with sclera or without periotomy and suture. So it'll all depend upon what is it that we're talking about, Dr. Khalid. Uh, what is the medical situation uh, in for which you have put this question? Uh, because if you are doing a slit, then uh, you're doing a simple limbal epithelial transplantation, then you'll be actually removing most of the panus and the fibrous tissue. So you'll have a large epithelial defect. In that, you'll have to put a, a, a only amniotic membrane, tuck it in the periphery with a fibrin glue, and then do your stem cell transplantation. 
uh, without if the amniotic membrane with only will only stick with glue in areas of epithelial defect. So I hope that principle is clear that amniotic membrane will not stick on an epithelized surface. In, in cases where it's epithelized, you can, you'll have to pass sutures. So if you have an epithelial defect on the cornea, if that's your question, if there's an epithelial defect on the cornea, then you can, you can do two things. Either you can do an only amniotic membrane and suture it and the epithelial defect would heal below. The second thing which you can do uh, is that you can have, you can create a periotomy and then you can tuck in this with the glue outside. So, uh, so probably I have answered your question. The next question is uh, in SLED, do you want, do you do two layers of AMT under the limbal stem cell and other above? Uh, no, there is a, most of the SLED that we have done, we do only one layer of AMT. We use the fibrin glue below that to stick the amniotic membrane and we put the limbal biopsies above it. There is a group uh, which does the, and the literature does mention the layer, the two layered AMT, but we have not done it. But yes, the literature mentioned, mentions two layered AMT as well. The only concern that I would be having in doing a double layered AMT is the basement membrane sometimes get integrated with the, with the cornea. So you may have a higher haze in these patients postoperatively and, and that may reduce the vision of the patient eventually. So I would want to do only one layer of the amniotic membrane with the glue and put the biopsies and put a B-cell above it. That would, that would in my hands would work very well. Um, Dr. Desai wants to ask, where can one get a cryopreserved amniotic? So there are a lot of eye banks lot of centers like ours in India, I'm sure there are people world over who have joined. There are a lot of eye banks who do give cryopreserved AMGs, uh, so from whom you can pre procure the cryopreserved amniotic. The technique of preparing it in your own center is we've described it in our presentation as well. Uh, the next question is, is there, is there any specific consideration of AMG in cases of OSSN? You, uh, in cases of OSSN, primarily or only trying to cover the defect. There is no uh, risk of getting uh, of, of any other risk that I can think of. So you have to only be covering the epithelial defect that you will be producing onto the conjunctival cornea with your amniotic membrane graft. The next question is that, so the epithelial side is in the shiny side of the amniotic membrane. Yes, you are right. So epithelium, I would just want to say that again, that it's a de-epithelized uh, amniotic membrane that is available in the market. So you have the basement membrane, which is the shiny one, which does not stick with the bud. And it is the stroma side. If you look at the histopathology, which I described, it's the stroma side, which has got the chorion below it. That's the sticky side. Yes, the shiny side is the basement membrane side. The sticky side is the stromal side. Which is which which is which sticks to your butt. That's how you identify the basement membrane up or basement membrane down. The question that we have next is: if we don't have fibrin glue, can we do the slit with other alternative or not possible? It is possible. If you have if 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 you do not have a fibrin glue, uh, the only difficulty you would have is you could either do uh, the other procedures of uh, uh, of limbal stem cell transplantation, that is that is claw, that is one procedure wherein you could avoid a fibrin glue. Uh, that that's where th that's what you can do. Uh, is there any indication of intraocular use of amniotic membrane? Uh, that's uh, that that's a tricky question because uh, intraocular use of amniotic membrane has been described in retinal disorders as well. I have specifically not covered in my talk, uh, primarily because I'm a cornea surgeon, I have no personal experience, but yes, it has been described in covering the macular holes, used for covering the macular holes and treating macular holes. Dr. Desai has a question. Dry amniotic membrane graft is very friable and thin and is not so useful as they are gamma irradiated. Therefore, please advise sourcing of cryopreserved AMG. Also, does one have to be registered with HOTA to use AMG? in the hospital. Uh, the HOTA registration is not required to use amniotic graft in your hospital. Uh, as I said, you can procure it from the eye banks which provide amniotic membrane graft. In India at Shroff's, we do supply the cryopreserved amniotic membrane graft. 
the people from other country will have to find out the resource wherein the cryopreserve one is supplied from. Can you kindly explain in some detail the surgical steps in using amniotic membrane uh, in bullous keratopathy? Is that the last resort? Would it be incompatible the IO for any other further? Uh, so this, this question I answered in my presentation, Dr. Azimuddin, that if you're, if, if you're using an amniotic membrane transplant in a patient with PBK, then it has to be in those cases wherein it is an end-stage disorder where you're not planning to do any visual rehabilitation. The technique that you can use is to do, uh, is to remove whole of the diseased epithelium and you can use a fibrin glue to stick an amniotic membrane over it or you can even do an only amniotic membrane to, uh, to epithelize the surface below. Either of the two would be useful in these patients. It reduces their pain, it reduces their discomfort, but definitely this is an eye we should not looking for vision in future. We have Dr. Briggs uh, who's asked us that, uh, are there any other concerns for transmissible infections besides hepatitis, HIV and syphilis? Not really. Uh, most of these membranes, when they are uh, sent out for usage, they are tested for most of the infections. So there is no uh, risk of having any transmission of infections. Dr. Bukhari has a question that if fibrin glue is not available, what would be the approach for the inlay technique? Uh, you could suture uh, the graft, but it will be difficult to do a multi-layer. But yes, you can. What you can do is you can take the 10 0 nylon suture and suture in that defect your uh, amniotic membrane, and then you can maybe, if required, put a, B, uh, put a BCL or you can put an only amniotic membrane and a BCL, depending upon what is the indication for which you're doing an in inlay techniques. Yes, that means you can take sutures for doing an inlay in these patients. Is the amniotic membrane transplant fresh? How long can we preserve in the standard conditions? Uh, fresh would not stand for too long. Uh, you would have to, you can only use it for some time and then you'll have to either look for a cryopreserved one or a, a lyophilized one. What form of amniotic membrane is best for slit? Cryopreserve the most extensive use uh, for slit uh, and uh, that I guess would be the best one which, which, which was available as compared to the lyophilized one. Uh, this one is the is better one because as I mentioned, the more you're going to preserve it, the lesser the growth factors would be. And in, in a patient where you have, you're doing a slit, uh, you're doing a limbal stem cell transplantation, you want to do the best uh, for that patient in the first go. Uh, how long, uh, Dr. Chansa, Chansa has a question, how long does it usually take for degradation of amniotic, especially when we want are supposed to counsel patients for visual potential? Uh, so usually one amniotic membrane transplant would get degraded in two to three weeks. So that's, that's the time period it gets degraded. And uh, you, you, if it's highly inflamed surface, it can get degraded earlier. Uh, so we have some thanksgiving from some of our viewers. Thank you all uh, for being a part along with me. And uh, there is a question which says, where, what are the post-AMT therapy, antibiotics and steroids, for how long do we give? So in, uh, in, in patients where you're doing amniotic membrane transplantation, then if it's an inflamed surface, you would definitely have to combine it with steroid therapy. And uh, that could be four to six times in the day. And an antibiotic therapy until your epithelial defect is healed, especially if you're using a BCL, uh, then you would have to use at least four times an antibiotic uh, eye drop. Uh, two weeks, as I said, the amniotic membrane will get degraded. And by that time, depending upon whether you uh, what is your ocular surface state, you can taper your steroids and reduce your, uh, stop your antibiotics if your epithelial defect has healed. In large terigium, uh, does the conjunctival autograft come above the amniotic graft or below it? So it comes above it, Dr. Azimuddin, it comes above it. In my, uh, in my presentation, uh, the amniotic membrane graft, which is substituting the large conjunctival defect is below. And over it, you can put a small conjunctival autograft. So that's how you do it. Can amniotic membrane be used in case of cornea bacterial ulcers? I've already answered this question. Uh, then I have the next question is that in SLET is the limbal biopsy suture to the AMG before BCL. So Kalpana, we do not suture it. 
we cut the biopsy of 2mm into about 10 to 14 pieces and we place it in the paracentral area of the cornea beyond the pupillary margin and inside the limbus, midway between the pupillary margin and inside the limbus in equal distance and we put fibrin glue. So it is stuck with the fibrin glue, you won't be able to suture it. Uh, what is your personal experience with dehydrated? So I do not really have a personal experience with dehydrated amniotic membrane, but with what literature says and what discussions we've been having, uh, the dehydrated one is papery thin and it's difficult to handle it. So definitely cryopreserved is the one which I use it and that's where I, I would be able to answer the questions. In both eye uh, of severe chemical burn, how you pro procure the limbal cells for SLET. So Kalpana in patients wherein you have a bilateral uh, chemical injury and uh, the patient is has got a bilateral limbal stem cell deficiency, you would have to do an allo stem cell transplantation. Uh, I hope uh, this was something which was useful and I enjoyed learning and sharing along with all the viewers and thanks for joining us and thanks to for CyberSight for inviting me for this webinar.